that's what I hear. <laughs> hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Before I introduce today's guest, I'd like to say a very exciting announcement I have that we discussed last month on the show when Dr. McDougall and Mary McDougall were the guests. Going forward, we are going to have the McDougals, Dr. John McDougall and Mary McDougall on once a month for a feature on Chef AJ Live called McDougal Monday. It will probably be the first Monday of the month. So I just wanted you guys to be the first to know. And this being the first Monday of the month, we are going to start with Dr. John McDougall, who is going to be defending the great potato, the humble spot and making eating potatoes great again. If you watch my show regularly, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Greger did a webinar on the potato. Many of you watched. As a matter of fact, we even Change the time of the show so that you guys could watch. Well, he said some things about the potato that Dr. McDougall did not agree with, and he wanted to debate him on the show or anywhere, but Dr. Mc, uh, Dr. McGregor. Dr. Gregor was not available, and he is always welcome to come on and give his point of view. But for a rebuttal on the potato webinar, please welcome a man who really needs no introduction, Dr. John McDougall. Thank you so much for taking the time to explain this to us. Well, thank you. Thank you, AJ. Uh, this is uh, in, in no way intended to in any way defame Dr. Michael Greger. Uh, there's just some points that I, I felt ought to be addressed. Uh, I encourage you not only to watch the, uh, the seminar that he gave on potatoes and give your own critical review of it, but also to uh, attend and sign up for his, uh, uh, his website, uh, which is uh, nutritionfacts.org. So let's just get into the presentation All right. Let me just check one more thing here. Yeah, just because we're seeing your slides on the left, if you can just change uh, the view. Yeah. All right. So are you able to see the slides? Okay. Oh, now it's perfect, Dr. McDougall. It's perfect. All right. Okay. Anyway, uh, the title, of course, is uh, To the Point. Uh, that is to address some of the issues on uh, Dr. Michael Greger's seminar that he put on September 17, 2021, titled, Are White Potatoes Bad for You? I mean, just that statement is a little bit challenging, isn't it? Well, I, I felt that I should, uh, I should answer some of these questions for, for your good, uh, for the edification of my patients. I just didn't feel I could wait forever to, to address this. I know at some time, uh, Dr. Greger and I may be able to talk. I certainly hope so. Uh, talk about these issues one-to-one, -one, but that wasn't the case. And so I took the uh, second best choice, which is to put together my thoughts. Uh, to begin, you know, Dr. Greger is a professional friend, not a personal friend, but a professional friend. And our relationship goes back many years. He tells me that uh, I got him excited and interested in... Into you. It's going to drum up inspiration. Okay, I, I got uh, I, I got he I am excited about uh, Dr. Atkins when I published a newsletter which is about the Atkins scientific research that it was uh, deceit and disappointment, and as a consequence of that particular newsletter, Dr. Greger put together a website called AtkinsFacts.org, and it's really a good website. It really uh, takes apart as should be done, uh, Dr. Robert Atkins. Uh, Michael Greger has also appeared at our advanced study weekends and never has, has denied an, us an opportunity to hear him talk and their phenomenal presentations. We also share some of the same mentors like uh, Nathan Pritikin and Walter Kempner. So we have a lot in common. And I would say our basic philosophies on diet and health are more shared than probably anybody else that I know. Uh, Every year, every issue, every English language nutrition journal of the world. So busy folks like you don't have to. I think of all of most interesting. It's groundbreaking. Most practical finds new videos and articles every day for my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. All right. Well, he clearly says that he does a lot of scientific research, and hopefully, some of the points that I bring out today, he will look at the solid science and find out whether I'm 
telling you the right thing or not, but we'll see. Uh, Dr. Greger, he uh, did this seminar, Are White Potatoes Bad for You? And uh, in it, he said some things. He said that uh, the McDougal recommendations on a, a program to eat only potatoes would result in all sorts of horrible, horrible things will happen because it's highly deficient. And specifically, he addressed uh, white potatoes that they cause you to go blind. And when we got around to sweet potatoes, he said, well, sweet potatoes are protein deficient. And I have suggested that people consider an all white potato and or an all sweet potato diet as an educational point of view. Not that I think it's the uh, perfect thing for you to do, but there are reasons that I think you ought to look at a single food and see how complete it is. The other thing that uh, Dr. Drager addressed at this webinar was, uh, during the webinar was, uh, the fact that potatoes raise the blood sugar. And this is reflected in a high glycemic index score. And he also said that this elevated blood sugar damaged the pancreas and caused type two diabetes. Well, you know, these are thoughts that are different than I have professed for the last 45 years. Uh, could I have been wrong? And I took it from that point of view that it's time to review the science and see whether or not the things that I held for the last 45 years are still true. And I get really excited to look at the science. Uh, just like Dr. Greger, I really love scientific research. And so I consider this a, a task of love and enjoyment. Uh, before we listen to Dr. Greger's segment about uh, the McDougal diet, I'd like to explain to you that the reason I uh, offer you to consider an all potato diet is because potatoes are nutritionally complete. Underground storage organs, in other words, vegetables that grow below the ground, like potatoes and sweet potatoes, are complete. They've got all the protein, all the vitamins, all the minerals, except for vitamin B12. And above ground storage organs, which would be your grains and your legumes, these are called seeds, high carbohydrate seeds, they're deficient. Uh, you have to add an additional bit of uh, vitamin C, and because they're, they're deficient in vitamin C, your above ground storage organs are. And the way you do that easily is just add a little bit of fruit, say a slice of orange or a little bit of vegetable, say a little piece of broccoli, and you've taken care of the A, and the a or excuse me, the C issue. And we'll address the, uh, the A issue, or excuse me, the A issue as we go through this discussion. Uh, vitamin A is, um, actually in the form in plants, it's a, it's a, a pre-vitamin A, and it has to be converted in the body from beta carotene into retinol, which is the active form of vitamin A. So that's the reason that I, I challenge people with the idea that they should consider an all potato diet, be it sweet potatoes or white potatoes. And some people have uh, taken this as a serious way uh, to eat. And this could be reflected in uh, the elimination diet I recommend, or Mary's mini, mini. That could have been a diet that focused on primarily white potatoes or sweet potatoes. Dr. McDougall says humans can get more than a protein amino acids from a diet entirely composed of potatoes alone, and so don't uh, need meat with other foods to compensate for missing amino acids. Do I agree with this? Please explain. The scientific findings take away, do the scientific findings take away any of the legitimacy of Dr. McDougall's belief? He's absolutely right. Amazing, you can live off of water and potato until you go blind from a vitamin A deficiency. Uh, but of course, he's not telling people, he's not advocating people, but it's just remarkable that has enough protein. So when people are like, where do you get enough protein? He likes to make the case, the point that like, well, look, I mean, not only is it not young, but you can just eat just potato, white potato, get all the protein you need. It's interesting, white rice, you can eat white rice, get all the protein you need, but of course, all sorts of horrible, horrible things that happen to you because it's a, it's a deliciously highly deficient diet. Um, now, if you want to eat a potato diet, well, what about eating a sweet potato diet, right? Because then you get a beta carotene, so you wouldn't go blind. Um, but the problem is it actually does not have enough protein. So sweet potato, um, uh, white potatoes have enough protein to live off of, it's simple. But sweet potatoes may actually not, so you could actually get a, a protein deficiency. So anyway, eat a variety of foods. I'm not advocating anyone will need a mono diet, but uh, yeah, he's right. There's no protein, but uh, it's, you know, where we, who needs, who 
decades to where the person is? Well, what we're talking about here, and it's uh, Dr. Greger's uh, definition, we're talking about, uh, about potatoes, which could be white potatoes or golden potatoes. Uh, and also we're talking about sweet potatoes and yams. And anything's not a sweet potato or yam, Dr. Greger considers to be a white potato and the kind of potatoes that would cause you to develop a deficiency in vitamin A. In other words, you would not provide enough beta carotene or other carotenoids to make the vitamin A to take care of very important processes in your body. So let's talk about, about going blind by eating a white potato diet. And what he's referring to is night blindness. And uh, it, what he's telling you is that you will develop night blindness if you eat an all white potato diet because it's deficient in A or the precursors of vitamin A, which are the carotenoids or beta carotene. Well, what is a night blindness? Night blindness is your inability to see well at night or in poor light, such as in a restaurant or a movie theater. You don't go blind. You just have a, uh, a diminished ability to see in dark circumstances. So what causes night blindness? I mean, the, the greatest cause of white blindness are problems like age-related macular degeneration, which affects a, a great many of the people in our country. Uh, myopia, which is nearsightedness. In other words, you can just see things near and not far. Glaucoma, which of course is very common. You must have friends with glaucoma, just as you have friends with cataracts. Uh, retinosis pigmentosa, uh, this is a, a loss of pigment cells in the retina, and diabetes. So these are the common causes of night blindness. And remember, it's really not going blind. It's just a diminished ability to see in the dark. As far as vitamin A deficiencies or beta carotene deficiencies, they're very rare. And they occur during circumstances of malnutrition. After people undergo bariatric surgery, they have intestinal bypass surgery or alcoholics. And that's where you see uh, night blindness. And if you give vitamin A, it will help with the night blindness, but it doesn't help with daytime vision. And I wanna make a lot of distinction here between daytime vision and nighttime vision in terms of what various kinds of potatoes provide. Well, you would expect that if white potatoes cause blindness or even night blindness, that some of it would be reported. So I went and looked at Google and the National Library of Medicine to see whether or not I could find Anybody suffering from night blindness or more serious condition, total blindness from eating a white potato diet. And the first thing I came across was uh, uh, white potatoes and blindness on the cause of blindness in potato tubers. What we are talking about here is that the, the uh, buds on potatoes become rotten and they call that potato blindness. So they were referring to potatoes in this particular case. So I had to, I had to look further to see whether or not I could find a case of blindness occurring with white potatoes. So I tried harder and I found this one case. And actually it's reported over and over and over again. If you look up white potatoes and blind or blindness, you'll find a case of a teenage boy who ate nothing but Pringles, French fries and white bread since elementary school and he went blind. So not to be deterred, I went to the National Library of Medicine and I put in white potatoes and vitamin A deficiency. And I found no cases. Uh, what I did find is a lot of references of uh, sweet potatoes being good for vitamin A deficiency or to correct night blindness. So again, not to be deterred, I put in the scientific name for potatoes and vitamin deficiency. And I found a case of an autistic child who didn't go blind, but had dry eyes. And uh, this particular child was living on fried potatoes and rice balls for two years. So I came up empty handed. Whereas if it was a serious problem, you'd expect a dozen, a hundred, a thousand reports, but that's all I could find. Now, 
has anybody who's lived on an all potato diet reported loss of night vision? Well, I know of a few circumstances where people have lived on all white potato diets. For example, six and a half million Irish lived for a period of about 200 years eating almost exclusively potatoes. And potatoes were a great crop. Potatoes, uh, when they were introduced into Europe, they changed the entire European societies. Uh, eliminated hunger. The uh, population of Ireland doubled in 40 years because of the availability of, ca uh, of calories from potatoes. So it's been a real boost to many societies, the introduction of white potatoes. And then of course they had a potato famine that occurred and that's what you hear a lot about. And, you know, that's attributed to, uh, to a, a blight that occurred in the potato crops, but actually it was more related to some political things that were going on between the Irish and the English. Uh, the, the Irish people, they ate between seven and 14 pounds of potatoes a day. And two potatoes equal one pound, so you can do the math. Uh, certainly it was a very feasible thing to eat that many potatoes, but they didn't report any night blindness. They did report a bacterial infection of the eye called trachoma, which is due to chlamydia bacteria and people suffer from blindness from this particular condition, but nothing even remotely related to night blindness or going blind completely. And then when there was the example of Denmark during World War I, uh, now, Kyle Hinhiti was uh, a very famous scientist in Denmark, and he had uh, a lot of connection with the Danish government. And so when the, the Northern blockade was set up between Britain and Germany, uh, Denmark is located right between these two countries. And as a result, they suffered uh, a severe shortage of, of food. And so what Nikhil Hinhiti did is he talked to the Danish government, he said, look, rather than Danes starving, let's not eat the animals anymore. And instead what we'll do is we'll eat, we'll eat the, uh, the foods the animals were eating. Now, these people were healthy on a white potato diet. They were well fed. They had plenty of food. They didn't suffer any hunger at all. And during that period of time, during those three years during World War I, they had a 34% reduction in death. It was the healthiest time that Denmark has ever experienced pre and post World War II. And even though they didn't live on all potato diet, uh, they certainly ate a lot of potatoes. But Mikhail Hinhiti also had, did some scientific experiments and one of his experiments involved a client of his, Madsen was his name, and he lived on an all potato diet, all white potatoes for a year. He didn't report any night blindness. In fact, he was, enjoyed excellent health. And one of the examples I like to talk about as far as a white potato diet occurred in 1925. What they did is they took a man and a woman and they put them in a controlled situation where they controlled all their food, their activity, et cetera. So they knew exactly what they were doing. And they fed them an all potato diet for six months. And what they reported at the end of the six months is they did not tire of the uniform potato diet. There's no craving for change. And even though they were physically active, they were what we call today marathon or triathlon runners. They were described as in good health on a diet in which the nitrogen protein was practically solely derived from the potato. But no report of night blindness on an all potato diet for six months. And then we have the uh, executive director of the Washington State State Potato Commission. And as a demonstration, what he went on was an all white potato diet for 60 days. And he continued the diet and eats primarily potatoes for eight years. And he didn't suffer any night blindness. And then we have Andrew Taylor who lost 117 pounds in one year on an all potato diet. But I do wanna tell you that Andrew Taylor, just to cover all bases, he did eat sweet potatoes. And Dr. Gregor, I think, would be very happy about that. So he didn't live exactly on an all white potato diet. It was a combination of sweet potatoes and white potatoes. So the conclusion I've had to come to is that there aren't any cases of night blindness occurring on a white potato diet, except in 
really bizarre situations. What I also come to the conclusion of is that the burden of proof lies with the accuser. I mean, I shouldn't have to prove a white potato diet is, is not going to cause night blindness. It should be the accuser that shows me that an all white potato diet will cause night blindness. Dr. McDougall says humans can get more than enough protein and amino acids from a diet entirely composed of potatoes alone. And so don't uh, need to eat with other foods to compensate for missing amino acids. Do I agree with this? Please explain. The scientific findings take away, the scientific findings take away any of the legitimacy of Dr. McDougall's belief. He's absolutely right. Amazing, you can live off of water and potato until you go blind from a vitamin A deficiency. Uh, but of course, he's not telling people, he's not advocating people, but it's just remarkable that has enough protein. So when people are like, where do you get enough protein? He likes to make the case, the point that like, well, look, I mean, not only is it not young, but you can just eat just potato, white potatoes, get all the protein you need. It's interesting white rice, you can eat white rice, get all the protein you need. But of course, all sorts of horrible, horrible things that happen to you because it's a, it's, a, it's a highly deficient diet. Okay, now recall, I showed you a few minutes ago that night blindness was just a, a diminishing in your ability to see under darkened situations. You can still read, you can still perceive colors, you can still drive a car. You don't go blind. So how would someone get it so wrong? Well, you know, common knowledge is that anything white, you know, food is bad. Anything white is bad. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about the eye and carotenoids. In poor countries where white rice and white potatoes are the basic foods, vitamin deficiency, vitamin A deficiency is found and so is night blindness, but they're not cause and effect. The idea that anything white is bad is uh, complete nonsense. Uh, there's an excellent article I ask you to look at. You can get it uh, from Google. And it talks about white potatoes, a forgotten source of nutrients. And it defends white potatoes and the idea that you can pick a food based on its color. In this article, they say color is not necessarily a guide to what and how much beneficial or toxic phytochemicals are present in what we eat. Colors of the food may mislead the consumer as to the effective content of nutrients and phytochemicals. So you ought to get rid of this idea that white food is bad. White is uh, actually all colors. And black is the absence of all colors. So white foods can be bad, like white chicken, white tuna, white bread, white sugar. But in reference to what we're talking about is white whole foods like potatoes, dried beans, cauliflower, turnips, onions, parsnips, mushrooms, corn, whatever that last one is. These are good foods healthy from every point of view. Uh, as far as carotenoids go, I'm not gonna burden you with a lot of science, but I want you to know there are about 750 carotenoids in nature that are made by plants, algae, that, uh, and also other organisms that photosynthesize. Uh, fruits and vegetables provide about 50 carotenoids that human beings require. Out of the 750, we require around 50 of them, and they're all different carotenoids. Lutein and uh, zeaxanthin are selectively concentrated in the macula. Now, now you're gonna have to remember this. I, I, there's a little bit of science I want you to, to understand as we go through this, is there are a couple, lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, they're concentrated in the macula and they're also provided by white potatoes. Your car carotenes are concentrated in the peripheral eye of the retina. And these are the ones we're talking about in terms of night blindness. In the peripheral part of the eye, the peripheral part of the retina, that's where you, uh, you turn on your night vision. And that's where you see. The central vision, the central vision is where you do your reading, you perceive color, it's you know, how you drive a car, at least in the daytime. And uh, here's a picture of the eye. And what you'll see is uh, your night vision, which is in your retinal pigments, is in the periphery of the eye. And uh, your macular 
pigments are in the central part of the eye, the macula, where you do most of your discriminated seeing, like reading. Now, what I want to tell you, and we'll talk about a little bit as we go on, is that white potatoes, they prevent you from suffering diseases like age-related macular degeneration, which cause blindness. And your night vision will restrict, excuse me, your, your colorful fruits and vegetables, which have the uh, carotenes in them, what they will do is they'll diminish your night vision. You don't go blind. Uh, the uh, different, different cells in the retina that we're talking about is we're talking about the rods, which is uh, the ones that are nourished by your colorful vegetables. And they're the ones that are in the periphery of the eye. And the cones are the ones that perceive color and, and really fine vision. They're for, for day vision. And again, to repeat, your white potatoes are the ones that provide the carotenoids that take care of the macula. In fact, the, the intense yellow color of the macula is due to those particular carotenoids from potatoes. If uh, you look into the scientific literature on how, how much carotenoid is present, the ones from green and yellow vegetables in various foods, you find something interesting is uh, white potatoes do have a little bit of beta carotene and other carotenes, which provide for your peripheral vision, for your night vision. And I have to assume that they have enough. And I say that because I just can't find any cases of night blindness and people will follow an all white potato diet and the literature doesn't, doesn't support it. Well, uh, the food manufacturers and scientists have responded to this particular concern and they've taken white potatoes and they've uh, used bacteria to create GMO potatoes. And I know this upsets a lot of you, but a lot of the potatoes you're buying, particularly the golden potatoes are ones that have been GMO engineered. And by GMO engineering, and again, you're eating white potatoes, uh, you produce an awful lot of these beta carotenes. In fact, uh, you know, 150 grams, which is a little more than a one white potato, supplies somewhere between 42 and 23% of these colorful pigments from golden potatoes we're talking about. Now, as far as uh, the connection between rural East Asian and African countries and the occurrence of uh, vitamin A deficiency and and night blindness, what you have to understand is that these people are living in these regions of the world. They don't live on all white potato diets, but what they do share in common is they're starving and they're sick. And when you go in with programs uh, to introduce vitamin A, they're pro well, primarily good by giving pills, retinol to this population of people, is you do reduce the occurrence of night blindness. But what we find is that people who suffer from white or night blindness in these, in these underdeveloped parts of the world, uh, they're ill, especially with diarrhea and measles. And this occurs in people who are at their most uh, susceptible time in their life, like when they're little children and, and pregnant women. If developed countries like the United States and European countries, uh, it's rare to see any night blindness. It's rare to see any vitamin A deficiency, but I went looking for it. If you take a look at a population that is comparable to your Asian and your African populations of people, and you use the only comparison I find, which I think is legitimate, which is the 3 million Danes that uh, followed the instructions of Mikhail Hinhidi, what you find is these people over a period of three years they did not eat all white potato diet, but they were healthy and they were well fed. They had plenty of food. And the interesting thing about this population, as I said before, is they had a, the best health that they've ever experienced. They had a 34% reduction in death during this three year period of time during World War I. Well, as far as uh, cases of of uh, vitamin A deficiency in developed countries, 
you know, as opposed to Asian Africa, rural Asian Africa. I, I went looking for a case and I found one report. It comes from Australia and it was an examination of 146 children who had vitamin A deficiency. They didn't have night blindness, but they had uh, dryness of the eyes. And what these children had in common is they were sick. They had cystic fibrosis and gastroesophageal reflux disease, short gut, gut syndrome, all problems that create mal malabsorption. Medical conditions such as autism, celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, anemia, and low iron levels. So yeah, you can find vitamin A deficiency in developed countries, but only among people who are ill, not people who are well fed. White potatoes uh, actually contain a lot of nutrients that are very friendly to the eye, not just your lutein's and your xanthophens. Uh, they contain bioflavonoids and phenolic acids and antioxidants and all kinds of different substances that promote the health of the eye. Yeah, they're deficient in your colorful carotenoids that come from colorful fruits and vegetables, but there's still some present. So to conclude this discussion, I, I wanna put things in perspective with you. So lutein and xanthin, which are in potatoes, they prevent age-related macular degeneration. Dr. Greger says on an all white potato diet, you'll go blind from vitamin A deficiency. You know, that's scary, but it's not true. Uh, vitamin A deficiency due to a decrease in these colorful vegetables results in loss of night vision and dry eyes, which you know are troublesome, but you don't go blind. With night vision, with, with night blindness, you can't see well in dim situations. And night blindness is easy to reverse by just taking in vitamin A. Now compare that to macular degeneration, which you are most likely to get if you exclude the carotenoids that are present in white potatoes. If that is the case, if that part of your eye, the central focus area of your eye becomes unhealthy, you can't read fine print, you can't drive, you can't uh, appreciate colors and you go blind from age-related macular degeneration, which is, what did I tell you? It was six and a half percent of the population over age 40. And this is not reversible. Age-related macular degeneration is, is due to scarring of the retina. It's not reversible, no matter what you try and do. So if you had a choice, I mean, if somebody gave you the theoretical choice, of uh, eating a diet with lots of colorful vegetables and avoiding night blindness as opposed to avoiding a diet that contained the carotenoids that supply the macula. And if you don't have those, you go blind, what would you choose? Well, no, fortunately you don't have to choose between the two because I showed you many examples of people living on all white potatoes, they didn't go blind, they didn't suffer from even diminishing vision, in other words, light blindness. Well, let's go on to the next subject that uh, Dr. Greger wanted to address, and that is protein deficient. If you eat a diet of sweet potatoes, that, that's what he said. You'd expect someone to report cases of uh, vitamin A deficiency excuse me, a protein deficiency by eating a diet of all sweet potatoes. I went and looked at the scientific literature on this. And what I found, and many studies have addressed this over the years because it's been an enigma for people who believe that sweet potatoes don't have enough protein. Sweet potatoes are only about 3% protein. And they've been befuddled by the fact that the people in New Guinea are very healthy. They're strong, they're warriors. They have very low cholesterol rates. Their blood sugars are low. They have very little diabetes. Heart disease is virtually unknown in the people that live in the highlands in New Guinea. On a diet that Dr. Greger says will cause you protein and amino acid deficiencies. Well, I do want to point out, and it may not have any relationship uh, to our whole discussion, but 
it seems to be important to mention it, is that the people on Papua New Guinea have some of the highest rates of blindness in the entire world uh, related to cataracts and glaucoma. So eating all that vitamin A didn't keep these people from going blind, but we're worried about them suffering from protein deficiency, even though they cannot be observed in scientific uh, examination of the millions of people in Papua New Guinea uh, has caused many people to not understand that sweet potatoes do provide an adequate amount of protein in all of the essential amino acids. The essential amino acids, uh, let me explain. Proteins are made of the same 20 amino acids, all rearranged in a different sequence, just like you make all the words in a dictionary with 26 letters. And these 20 amino acids, uh, 12 of them we can make. Uh, eight of them we can't make, and we have to get them from the food. These are called the essential amino acids. There are eight of them that the adult requires. A very young infant requires an extra two amino acids. As far as adults, we can make 12. We have to get eight from the food. Those are the essential amino acids. Now, the world's expert on this was a man named William Rose. He actually discovered some of the amino acids in his laboratories. And he did experiments on the requirement of amino acids for an adult, an adult male that was consuming 3000 calories a day. And his, his uh, subjects were his students who were very excited about uh, being part of these experiments because they would have their name in the scientific papers and they got a dollar a day, yeah. And so he had no trouble getting volunteers. And what he would do is he would feed these people mixtures of various amino acids and he'd leave one amino acid out. And then he would take and he would, uh, he would notice when these people developed symptoms of amino acid deficiency. And it was really profound. They became very agitated, they were fatigued, they just didn't thrive. You could had no trouble noticing it when there wasn't one of the essential amino acids provided in the mixture that uh, William Rose fed to his subjects. He uh, published 17 of the classic journal articles, scientific research papers in the Journal of Biologic Chemistry, one of the most famous researchers in the entire world. Well, I became familiar with Dr. William Rose and I looked at what he discovered in terms of amino acid needs in adult males consuming 3000 calories a day. And what he did is he took, which you notice in the first green bar, he took the amount of amino acid required by the lowest, the lowest amount of amino acid required by any of his subjects. And he made that the minimum amino acid requirement. And then what Dr. Rose did is he doubled the minimum amino acid requirement and he made the recommended amino acid requirement, which is, is the second green column there. And if you take a look at uh, any single food, and of course, if any single food has these qualities, then any combination of food has to have these qualities. And what you find uh, applying to the subject at hand is that sweet potatoes, based upon the findings that were presented in J. Pennington's Food Values of Portions Commonly Used, the 13th edition, the 13th edition, which is what I used when I published these findings in one of my first books, The McDougall Plan, in 1983. What you find is that sweet potatoes, for every single essential amino acid, sweet potatoes exceed Rose's recommended, which is twice the minimum, which is the most any subject required in his experiments. That was 40 years ago, folks. Well, since that time, a new copy of J. Pennington's Food Values of Portions Commonly Used has been printed. And uh, this is the 19th edition, and I happened to get a hold of a copy of the 19th edition. And what I found is that in this book, they have almost doubled the amount of essential amino acids provided by sweet potatoes, almost twice as much as was in the 13th edition. And what you find is that the sweet potato, the amount of essential amino acid for sweet potatoes exceeds 
many fold Rose's minimum and Rose's recommended requirements. In other words, folks, what I'm telling you is based on nutritional values and scientific literatures, it just doesn't happen. Well, you know, finally what I did is I looked at the world, the world Health Organization's recommendations for amino acids. And I particularly looked at sweet potatoes, which is the food under question right now. And what you find is that sweet potatoes, based upon what the World Health Organization recommends for the requirement, far exceeds each and every essential amino acid as far as its delivery goes. And uh, what you find is that sweet potatoes provide at least twice as much, based on World, World Health Organization recommendation, at least twice as much of each essential amino acid. But there's you know, something happened between uh, the latest report of the World Health Organization and its previous report. And that is with the exception of histidine, the sulfur containing amino acids, which are the methionine and cysteine and tryptophan, all values are about twice as high as in the previous edition. Again, they just added a fudge factor there as far as requirement and still, still, Sweet potatoes far exceed twice as much of uh, each and every uh, essential amino acid. So how many cases of protein or amino acid deficiency will you find if you search the scientific literature and you look for whole foods causing these problems? None. But the burden of proof lies with the accuser. I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to prove this to you, although I think I, I have done so. Well, that uh, didn't play exactly right, but uh, I'm sure you get the point. So how would someone get it wrong? How would someone come to the conclusion that there are not sufficient amounts of essential amino acids in whole plant foods, in particular sweet potatoes? Well, it's because current standards for protein needs are based on bigotry. I'm going to explain that to you. And common knowledge is that vegetarians, vegans are protein deficient. Everybody knows this. I mean, when they find out that you're a vegan or a vegetarian, what's the first thing they're going to ask? Where do you get your protein? Even experts know that plant proteins are incomplete. Even today, experts will tell you from major universities that you can't get enough protein or essential amino acids uh, by eating a vegan or vegetarian diet, plant foods. Based on bigotry, where do our standards come from? They come from a guy named Carl Voigt. He's the father of modern, modern dietetics and he established the Voigt standard for the uh, amount of protein that you require. He believed that uh, flesh makes flesh, so you need to eat meat to get muscle. And uh, Voigt believed that people with sufficient income to afford any food choices would make the right choice. And who are these people with sufficient income? Oh, they were white people. 
And so he said that uh, these people with sufficient income, in other words, white people would instinctively select a diet with the right amount of protein. And so that's how the standards for essential amino acids came about or for your protein needs came about. And you here you have the protein needs. They require somewhere between 130 and 180 grams of protein a day. They, they didn't base this on any experiments. And at that time, uh, brown and black people were living on half the amount of protein as white people. And they were the ones that were, that were performing the hard physical work. So that should have been a, enough contradiction for people to understand that the uh, protein recommendations that still exist today are based upon nonsense, upon bigotry, not upon science, not upon observations that people could easily make. Frances Morrill Pay wrote a book called Diet for a Small Planet, a best-selling book. And in there, she explained that uh, plant foods were incomplete proteins and you had to mix and match your foods to get all the essential amino acids. Well, Frances Morrill Pay, she came out 10 years later uh, with her 10th anniversary book, Diet for a Small Planet, and she apologized. But 3 million people already read her first book. She apologized and said she was wrong. You don't have to mix and match foods to get all the essential amino acids. That Each and every food has, plant food has all the essential amino acids. Now, as far as experts believing incorrect information, uh, they are far, far and wide. Uh, for example, Harvard School of Public Health, they say other proteins lack one or more amino acids that the body can't make from scratch or create by modifying another amino acid called complete proteins, called incomplete proteins. These usually come from fruits, vegetables, and grains. That's Harvard School of Public Health stand today. The American Heart Association, they said something similar in their nutrition committee back in 2001, and we're gonna address that a little bit more detail in a minute. But you have uh, Tufts Human Nutrition Research uh, Department. They tell you you can't get all the essential amino acids, that plant foods are incomplete protein. Uh, the Tufts Medical School takes a similar stand, and so does the Freiburg School of Medicine, Northwestern University. And I could probably go on and on and on of all the people who still hold this belief that plant foods are incomplete. They don't provide all the essential amino acids, much less enough protein. Well, I had a chance to address the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee when they published an article in 2001 that was criticizing low carb diets, the Atkins type diet. They explained there that this kind of diet would make you sick, that uh, would cause problems such as heart disease and osteoporosis and so on. And uh, in this particular article, they said something. They said, although plant proteins form a large part of the human diet, most are deficient in one or more essential amino acids and therefore regarded as incomplete. Well, I read this in this paper condemning low carb or condemning, yeah, low carb, high protein diets like the Atkins diet. But when I got to this particular statement, I was troubled to say the least. So I, I wrote the American Heart Association, their journal circulation I wrote. And uh, they published my article in uh, the journal circulation. And in there, I said that uh, although plant proteins form a large part of the human diet, most are deficient in one or more essential amino acids. It's not true. And they came back to me Barbara Howard, who is the head of the Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association, came back and she said, uh, it's difficult to maintain essential amino acids at an optimal level on a plant protein diet. She argued, said I was wrong. But if you'll notice there, she didn't offer a single scientific reference to support her one paragraph poorly written statement that was published in the journal circulation, which by the way, you can download, it's open access. And I wanted it published in their journal so that you could read it 40 years later or forever. Well, you know, I, I wrote back to them another letter and I, I said, look, Barbara Howard's uh, letter was confusing and undocumented by a single citation. And I asked them, please give me the courtesy of a professional and honest answer by either showing me that I'm incorrect by citing scientific research that contradicts my position 
or you can admit that you're wrong. There's no C, there's no three. It's either A or B, one or two. Either I'm right or you're right. Well, they, they kind of ignored me for a while. And they said, okay, well, we'll publish your statement in the online version of this journal circulation. I said, no, you won't. You're gonna publish it in the hard copy so people can read it you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. And they finally did. And you'll notice Barbara Howard's uh, response to me. She had a nice, nice long response, again, poorly written. And uh, she supplies uh, seven citations from the scientific literature. And her main support for her contention that plant foods are incomplete proteins and they don't supply all the essential amino acids was Joseph Millward, the world expert on protein and essential amino acids. Well, I'd read Dr. Milward's research, his papers, and I knew what they said. They just said just the opposite of what Barbara Howard contended. So I wrote uh, Dr. Milward in Surrey, England, and I said to him, you gotta weigh in on this. This is important for people to understand that plant foods provide all the, the essential amino acids, of plenty of protein so that people can make, make choices that are life and death, whether they have a heart attack or breast cancer or diabetes. You've got to straighten this out. And uh, Joseph Milberg, uh, he wrote back and he said, I'm going on vacation. So I waited a month and I figured, well, you know, in Europe, maybe you take long vacations, but I waited a month. And I wrote Dr. Milberg and I said, hey, you know, you really need to answer me. I don't know how long your vacations are, but you really need to answer me. And so he did. And this is what he said. He said, I thought I made my position quite clear in my published papers. In an article I wrote in the Encyclopedia of Nutrition, I said, contrary to general opinion, the distinction between dietary protein sources in terms of nutritional superiority of animal over plant proteins is much more difficult to demonstrate and less relevant. And he's completed his letter to me. He said, this is quite distinct from the American Heart Association position, which in my view is wrong. Well, I said, I said the uh, Barbara Howard and the Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association, Joseph Millward's letter. And it only took him 10 years, but they finally, they finally changed their position. And you, you can go to the American Heart Association on on the internet and you can look up vegetarian and you can find the following statements. You don't need to eat uh, foods from animal sources to have enough protein in your diet. Plant, plant proteins alone can provide enough of the essential and non-essential amino acids as long as the sources of dietary protein are varied and caloric intake is high enough to meet energy needs. Of course, you have to have enough food. Whole grains, legumes, vegetables, seeds, nuts, they all contain both essential and non-essential amino acids. You don't need to consciously combine these foods, in other words, complementary proteins, within a given meal. It took them 10 years, but that's what they hold to today is plant foods are complete. They have all the essential amino acids. Now, the other schools, the other universities, they haven't come around. They still teach nonsense. The high glycine can back up potatoes may increase the risk of type 2 diabetes, perhaps by chronically overstimulating insulin producing cells in the pancreas. In uh, the potato lecture that, uh, that Michael Greger provided for us, uh, the one hour seminar, he talked about how potatoes raise or their high glycemic index foods. And we're going to talk about this. As a result, they, they raise the blood sugar high and raising the blood sugar high stresses out the pancreas and damages it and that way causes type two diabetes. Well, I, I found the articles that uh, Dr. Greger uses to support the fact that potatoes cause diabetes. And he recognizes this. He, he recognizes the fact that most of them are talking about French fries and potato chips and other fried potatoes. And they're not talking about whole foods. Well, this was uh, finally put to rest. Uh, the verdict has come in. Non-fried potatoes are innocent as far as causing diabetes. Published in the British Journal of Nutrition, 
just last year. Uh, the title of the article is Daily Intake of Non-Fried Potatoes Does Not Affect Markers of Glycemia, in other words, blood sugar, and associated with better diet quality compared with refined grains, a randomized crossover study in healthy people. It's settled. And I think uh, Dr. Greger understands this, even though he tried to teach us something different. He tried to teach us that white potatoes are still suspect in causing diabetes. If you want to read about how the, the glycemic index foods, there's another article that I would refer you to. It's open access. You can get it. It's white vegetables and glycemia satiety. And what they say in this particular article is application of the glycemic index in isolation to judge the role of white vegetables in a diet, and specifically in the case of potato are as consumed in ad libitum, in other words, you eat as many potatoes as you want, has led to premature and possibly counterproductive dietary guidance. This is non-scientific to use the glycemic index to support diseases. I mean, glycemic index is just one quality of a food. You have to look at the calories, the protein, the fiber, all kinds of things, the, the methods of cooking. And I addressed this in a newsletter I published in 2006 uh, titled Glycemic Index, not ready for prime time. The glycemic index, well, just to explain what this is all about, is uh, a selected food is fed to people and then the rise in blood sugar is uh, documented. What they use as a standard is white bread or table sugar, white sugar. And that's considered 100%. And then what they do is they compare other foods with that standard of white sugar or white bread. And what you find is that uh, there are many foods that show a small rise. These have a low glycemic index in blood sugar. And there are foods that are considered a high glycemic index like, like potatoes. But if you look at the glycemic index of, of some foods, you'll find that this is uh, really bizarre. Like chocolate cake has a glycemic index of 38. It's a low glycemic index food. Boiled potatoes have a glycemic index of, of 101. Yeah, so you, you, as, you, as you look through values of glycemic index, you find this kind of contradiction. You, you can't use glycemic index to, to say that it causes diabetes or any other condition. Looking at various studies on the effect of uh, feeding potatoes to people uh, in type two diabetics, they found that potatoes don't cause an excessive rise in blood sugar. And that the rise in blood sugar was similar in all starches, nothing particular about potatoes. And uh, feeding potatoes to, uh, to people, they find that it doesn't cause the blood sugar to rise. It's not associated with unfavorable post-meal rises in blood sugar in individuals that have type two diabetes. And then to go on and say that uh, type two diabetes is caused by damage to the pancreas due to this rise in blood sugar, is it correct? A rise in blood sugar does not damage the pancreas. So what they have is they have the horse before the cart. What causes damage to the pancreas is fat. Going back as far as 1927, and looking at the work at Shirley Sweeney. Shirley Sweeney, he fed his medical students uh, various kinds of diets and looked at their, their uh, glucose tolerance tests afterwards, looked at the rise in the blood sugar. And you find when uh, he fed to his students uh, sugar, candy, pastry, white bread, baked potatoes, syrup, bananas, rice, oatmeal, that none of them tested diabetic on this high sugar diet. And then he took the same students and he fed them a diet that was high in fat, olive oil, butter, mayonnaise, egg yolks, cream. Every one of the students tested diabetic on a high fat diet. It's fat that paralyzes the insulin, which causes people to develop type two diabetes along with the associated obesity they developed from eating a high fat diet. This all should have been settled by Percival Hemsworth's work. He's considered the father of diabetes. 
he published in the British Medical Journal in 1940, the effect of high fat versus high carbohydrate, in other words, high sugar diets on individuals who have type two diabetes. And what we find is high fat diets cause an excessive rise in blood sugar, whereas high carbohydrate, in other words, high sugar diets don't cause this high rise in blood sugars. So we've known for, boy, let's see, 80 years what the truth is. And then we have the work of Brunzel, University of Washington. He took uh, healthy people, excuse me, he took people who had type two diabetes and he fed them initially a synthetic mixture of multidextrin, uh, maltose and dextrins, which are simple sugars. 45% of his experimental diet was made of these simple sugars. And then what he did is he took the same type two diabetics and he fed them a diet that had about twice as much sugar. It was 85% maltose and dextrans, which are simple sugars. And what he found was that every aspect of their diabetes improved when you doubled the sugar intake. And what they explained in this New England Journal of Medicine article is that sugar increases the power of insulin, the sensitivity of insulin, whereas fat paralyzes the insulin. One of Dr. Greger's mentors is uh, Walter Kempner, and I have no doubt he has tremendous respect for this man. Walter Kempner introduced the rice diet at Duke University in 1939. It existed for seven decades at Duke. In fact, it supported Duke University in Durham, North Carolina for two of those decades. It was the financial support for that university. Well, Walter Kempner's diet, his rice diet, was a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. It was 93% carbohydrate, 93% sugar. And yet he cured type two diabetes at a rate of nearly 100%. We also got some really other remarkable results in patients. And you know, if you're really interested in diet therapy, nutritional medicine, and a better way to take care of people, people who are extremely ill, You'll study Walter Kempner's work as you'll study Nathan Pritikin's work. And by the way, I have their scientific papers published on my website for you to read. A thousand pages from Walter Kempner and 500 pages from, pages from Nathan Pritikin, free for you to read. Decreased heart size, improved kidney function, reversed eye damage from diabetes, reversed obesity, diabetes itself, high blood pressure, heart failure, people who had hearts swollen to the point where they filled almost the entire chest because their heart was in such severe failure. He caused half of these people to, to develop normal heart sizes to get them out of heart failure. Really remarkable work. And as far as type one diabetes, uh, a recent article was published in 2013 on feeding type one diabetics. We've been talking about type two diabetics all along. And feeding type one diabetics and diabetics, in other words, diabetics who don't make any insulin at all, who have to inject their insulin. And what this article found in their scientific research is that when you fed fats and oils to type one diabetics, you increase the need for insulin. In other words, fat paralyzes insulin folks, not sugar. So anyway, all sorts of horrible, horrible things will happen to you if you follow the McDougal highly deficient diet. So says Dr. Greger. An all potato diet will cause you to go blind, not just night blindness, but be said blind. And an all sweet potato diet will cause you to be protein deficient. And white potatoes that raise your blood sugar, which is reflected in a high glycemic index, which causes type two diabetes by damaging the pancreas. I, I showed you. In the video clips, this is what he says, and he believes this. Well, folks, after I presented this material to you, you decide, are white potatoes good or bad? You know, have I been irresponsible to my patients for the last 45 years? You decide, because it's really, really important that we clarify the role of white potatoes 
for our future. I mean, potatoes could save us from global warming. You know, we're in a horrible situation today with uh, climate change and experts predict that even if we stopped all fossil fuel produ production, it's, it's not enough. That we have to make a worldwide change in diet. And the Eat Lancet Commission, which is the most respected diet climate change organization says that if you change from the typical Western American diet to a vegan diet, you can reduce your production of global warming gases by 80%. In other words, potatoes have saved the world in the past and they're likely the food that's gonna save the world in the future. I mean, after all, they helped us through World War II. You know, potatoes were heavily promoted to our soldiers during World War II. Comparing uh, the global warming gases, greenhouse gases, between potatoes and say beef, you find that cattle generate 57 times more greenhouse gases than do potatoes. The World Health Organization declared the year 2008, the year of the potato. Why? Because the potatoes are so productive. You can grow more protein, more calories on an acre of potatoes than you can on rice or wheat. They'll grow on less water than rice. They'll grow at high altitudes and low altitudes in wet climates and in dry climates. They are the lowest carbon footprint of any of your starches. So the World Health Organization understands how important the potato is. And anyone who maligns the potato, it has to be stopped. Our future depends on it. Well, Dr. Greger, there are a few other topics that we differ on and I'd like to settle them for the edification of my patients. They need to know about these controversies. I know you're busy. And uh, if you don't wanna discuss them together, uh, I would guess you will find me discussing them by myself, like I did in this presentation. No disrespect intended. I think you're a great man and a great doctor. You just happen to got, have gotten a few things wrong about potatoes. Wow, Dr. McDougall, that was amazing. You did so much research. It just was what a well thought out and well presented PowerPoint presentation. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you, AJ. I mean, I had a lot of fun doing it and it did. It made me go back and look at work I hadn't really looked at in 40 years intensively. One of the questions- made me consider, you know, true white potatoes have, you know, they have very little amounts of these beta and alpha uh, carotene molecules. And I understand why people are concerned, but white potatoes do have enough. And if you look at the golden potato, which I know GMO biologically manipulated potato, which is what you're buying a lot in the store, they're just loaded with these uh, carotenoids. They come from colorful vegetables. And I had to look again at the, the amount of protein, the essential amino acids that are provided based on standard recommendations, not just the recommendations of William Rose, who's the, the one who did the original research in the amino acid requirements, but you know what the World Health Organization recommends for our amino acid requirements. And I'll tell you, each and every starch far exceeds any recommendations. And in particular, sweet potatoes far exceed in the essential amino acids, any recommendations that I'm aware of. Dr. McDougall, before we go on with the questions, if you have time to answer, may I take a moment to please ask you a favor? One of your biggest fans, Esther Loveridge, is watching live. You know her success was based on your work. I believe you even endorsed her book. It's her birthday today, and I bet it would mean the world to her if you wished her a happy birthday. Oh, Esther, happy birthday. Esther writes me at least once a week and tells me how she's doing and how she's spreading the good nurse news. And you know, Esther, I know why you're trying to change your friends and relatives in the whole world. And that's because helping other people is the greatest reward you can get. And so I encourage you to go out there and spread the good news. I encourage all of you to go out there and spread the good news. 
it's about time. So Dr. McDougall, a few people wrote questions in in advance, but a couple of the things that I'm seeing in the chat are people wanting to know, and of course, I know the answer to this, did you watch the potato webinar? And of course you did. Well, I, I played segments from it. Yes, I did. And I'm sorry that one segment didn't play well on the essential amino acids and, uh, and sweet potatoes, but it, I played it previously for you. So you can go back and watch it where Dr. Gregory tells you the sweet potatoes uh, will cause you to be protein and amino acid deficient. Right. Well, well, yeah, of course I watched it. Yeah, well, I, I know that Dr. McDougall, but I wanted just for you to verify. And, 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 and my impression is, is there's a lot of good things said in this. That's my impression of Dr. Gregor is he conveys uh, very important messages to people. They're very specific. Uh, sometimes he uh, focuses in detail on things that I don't think should be focused in detail on and he misses the big picture. But maybe the reason I, I look at the big picture is I've personally taken care of over 12,000 patients. So, you know, I don't look at the research initially. I look at my patients. I have that particular advantage. Great. Yeah, well, people are saying they're worried about nutrient density because a kale has a nutrient density of a, a hundred or a thousand and potatoes don't. But I remember seeing a video of Dr. Doug Lyle where he basically said nutrient density is a crock that our body is able to recycle any nutrients we need and we don't have to eat specific foods for specific nutrients. Correct. Yeah, you know, the plant foods have all the nutrients. Uh, the way I want you to look at it is that nature doesn't make mistakes. And you know these these are good times. We have maybe six thousand different foods to choose from in the grocery store, but that's not the way it's been through most of human history. I mean, people were lucky enough if they got enough to eat to supply the calorie needs of the family. I mean, you know, the the uh, the provider was usually a man uh, left the home. And uh, the, the, the homemaker didn't say, I hope you find uh, enough varied foods with enough varied nutrients so that we can mix and match and we can get enough to eat. They, the homemaker said, hey, just get enough food so our family doesn't starve. And thank goodness the foods are complete. You know, almost every society throughout all of human history has lived on a single starch. And the amount of starch in their diet on traditional diets is about 90% of the food it comes from starch, rice, corn, potatoes. You know, in China before uh, 1980, 80% of the diet came from white rice. And before 1980, there was no obesity in China. There was no type two diabetes in China on a diet that 90% of the food came from white rice. Now the Chinese have become very rich and they've changed their diet. So today it's reported that 12% of the Chinese have diabetes and 50% are pre-diabetic. In the last 40 years with modernization, well, is it a good thing? Well, maybe, but not in terms of health, not in terms of getting diseases or functioning to your optimum. As far as nutrient dense foods, you, you need enough nutrients to fill the needs of the body. Any, any more than enough, what do you do with it? You uh, pee it out in the toilet? Uh, that's usually what you do with them. Uh, you, you, you can only use the amount that's required and any excess has to be rid of. So what does it do? Well, I'll say it when you take in fat. Uh, the body stores fat, doesn't it? The fat you eat the fat you wear. And we see what happens to that particular nutrient. But how about protein? We eat a very high, high, fat, high protein diet. The American diet is, what does the body do with protein? Does it store it? If it did, it store it in the muscles. And we'd all look like Arnold Schwarzenegger used to look. Now the body dumps that excess protein. And it does it in some harmful ways. It overworks the liver and the kidneys. It causes the bone to dissolve, to neutralize the acidic amino acids that are in the animal proteins, causing osteoporosis and kidney stones. Excess is not good. So stop looking for more. More is not necessarily good. 
You know, Dr. McDougall, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Gundry, who tells people not to eat beans because of the lectins and all of the plant-based doctors rally around that and saying that he's wrong. But some of the plant-based doctors are telling people not to eat things like potatoes and rice and making it more difficult, you know, because not first it's the arsenic and rice. And now, you know, Dr. Greger says, if we're going to eat a potato, we have to cook it first and then chill it. Yeah. Well, as I, as I mentioned before, Dr. Greger gets into the specifics, into the details which are, are, are things that are really not necessary for a good general message. Not necessarily good for a good general message. And, and, and I encourage you not to look at the details and to make or break your day based upon any particular nutrient that is favored or unfavored. Uh, the, the message is very simple. The human being is a starch eater, a starchitarian, a starchivore. Of all populations of people who've walked this planet, they've lived on starch. The bulk of their calories has come from starch, almost every single population. Rice in Asia, corn in Central America, potatoes in South America among the Incas, corn for American Indians. Iraq and Egypt, they used to be countries that were in the breadbasket of the world. Of course, with modernization, with CNN news, with, uh, with the, uh, the rise in fossil fuels and industrial technology, we've changed the whole world. You know, it was only 20 years ago that the World Health Organization told us that diseases of excess now exceed diseases of insufficiency. We live in a time of diseases of excess, heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, cancer. Whereas we used to live in a situation of starvation, but you know, you don't have to choose between these two. You know, there are good things about industrial revolution and having energy, not fossil fuels, but energy to have this kind of society we have, but you don't have to sacrifice your health. You need to eat a traditional diet. And that's the way I describe the diets that I recommend to people. It's not so offensive when I tell you you should eat the diet of the Mayas and Incas or the Aztecs or the diet of the people of the Middle East or the diet of Asians that people used to eat before 1980. Now for, for you know, as far back as I can go as two and a half million years, humanoids have lived off plant-based diets. And certainly over the last 100 to 200,000 years, people have, lived off starch. This isn't just a, a modern phenomenon that occurred with the Industrial Revolution 12,000 years ago. No, it dates back to the people in Mozambique that 105,000 years ago, they were living on starch. The Neanderthals, 30 to 40,000 years ago, had starch-based diets. You know, it's, you, you have to ignore the science to come to the conclusions that we've come to. And I have to tell you, people are really good these days at ignoring science. Yeah, oh, okay. Adrienne says, whenever she eats potatoes, even a few bite, any kind of potato, she gets sleepy. What would cause that? I have no idea. Because, because, but, but, you know, I, I do have an idea. Well, I, no, I, I really don't have any idea. <clears throat> uh, what, what, what do athletes eat? Carbohydrates. Yeah. Uh, and good athletes have discovered that you should carbohydrate load every day, not just before a race. And do you know that athletes these days are choosing foods with a high glycemic index because they want that sugar. They want to put the sugar back into their muscles in the form of glycogen. And they figured out they can do that more efficiently, faster by picking high glycemic index foods like potatoes. Winning athletes eat starch-based diets. This goes back 2,000 years that I can tell you a good example of, and that's in, uh, in, in, in a place uh, that is now Turkey, Ephesus. Uh, 2,000 years ago, they discovered, uh, 2,000 years ago, people ate starch-based diets, and they, good people, athletic people, and they discovered this when they unearthed a, a grave plot about 20 years ago, and they found 60 skeletons. And uh, they could tell what these skeletons used to do because they were buried with their shields, swords, and tritons, and they had triton holes in their head. 
and uh, they analyzed the bones of these men. And what they found, you could tell what people used to eat, their chronic diets, by the minerals that are present in their bones or hair. And what they found is that the gladiator lived on starch. They lived on barley. In fact, the, the gladiator, if you read the stories of the gladiator, they're known as the barley men. Now, well, why do the gladiators eat barley? Well, somebody owned them. And they were interested in them winning, just like uh, owners of racehorses want the horse to win in the Kentucky Derby. They don't ask the horse what he or she wants to eat. Uh, they tell them, you're going to eat this because you'll run faster. And so what did the gladiator owners make the gladiators eat? They ate a vegan diet, a starch-based diet. They were known as the barley men. They lived on a diet of barley, barley and beans. Well, barley and beans, why? Because it's, it's not so good losing in the Colosseum. You want to have as much endurance and as much strength as you can possibly get, and you get that from starch-based diets. Even, even the athletes, gladiators, so to speak, today, those people who run marathons and triathlons, they, they eat starch-based diets. The winners of, 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 the, of the recent marathons and triathlons have been Ethiopians and Kenyans. Now they, they won the Boston Marathon, the Chicago Marathon, the Honolulu Marathon, and 80% of their diet is corn. They're not running on fruit. They're not running on berries. People are saying, well, berries are healthier than potatoes and cooked food makes you lethargic. Yeah, well, you know what? There's a lot of misunderstanding out there. If that were true, then why do we not know societies that lived on berries? <laughs> no, you just can't do it. Look, if you were going to live on, on high nutrient dense foods, like for example, cabbage, I'd have to eat 11 pounds of cabbage a day. It's nutrient dense, but it's calorie dilute. You, you can't live on plant foods that are, are, are nutrient dense, calorie deficient like kale. Can you imagine somebody eating a diet of kale or lettuce or celery or broccoli or cabbage? Nope. I mean, you don't have enough time in the day to do that and you would have a grumbling stomach and you wouldn't feel good and you wouldn't have the energy. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. All large successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable his history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. I gave you the examples, Aztecs and Mayans, people of the corn, Incas, lived on potatoes, except when they went to battle, they switched to quinoa because potatoes were too heavy to carry. The breadbasket of the world, they lived on, on wheat and barley. And when you think of Asians, I mean, what do you think about as far as food goes? I mean, the Chinese have a, a saying for good morning, which is, have you had your rice today? That's how they greet themselves. Have you had your rice today? Come on, think about it. You got enough nutrients. You need clean calories is what you need. And you get those from starches. Yeah. I don't understand how some of the raw fooders that are successful are doing it. I just, I guess they're eating more fat in place of the starch. I guess so. You know, I went to a, a raw food restaurant in San Rafael. Oh, you're talking well, about Roxanne's and Lark's? Yeah, yeah, Roxanne's. And uh, well, I, one of our, 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 our clients, uh, people who went through my uh, living program, they, there's a treat they brought us to Roxanne's. Uh, I couldn't afford it at that time. It would cost us $500 for the meal. And uh, they served uh, raw vegan food. And uh, I ordered uh, the uh, lasagna which was made of, I, I forget, but it was. The servings are like, I, I, listen, I, she went to the same culinary school as me and she's yeah. so talented, but the servings are really small. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, it, it, was, it, it was like four postage stamps of food is what I got on this plate. And my host asked me, well, how'd you like your dinner? And my smart comment was, well, that's barely enough food to get me to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he, Think about it again. Uh, if, you know, if, if history of billions of people, 99.99% .99 of people who have walked this earth have lived on starch-based diets. Why would we all of a sudden change? And if we did make that change, we wouldn't make it as a, as a species. How are you going to grow enough calories of broccoli or kale to feed 7 billion people? It would be expensive. It'd be wasteful and you couldn't do it. Same thing with people who are promoting nuts and seeds and other high fat plant foods. 
you know, they would supply plenty of calories, but good grief, it's just uh, so inefficient. You couldn't feed any large population of people on nuts and seeds and other high fat plant foods, avocados. No, I mean, hey, nutrient dense foods like non-starchy green and yellow vegetables like broccoli and kale, et cetera, they're not unhealthy. You just, it's just you cannot center your diet on them. Nuts and seeds, they're not unhealthy. It's just that they're 90% fat. And if that's your diet, guess what? The fat you eat is the fat you wear. So there are lots of fat vegans out there. And I know why. Yeah, my favorite saying of all time. I, I wish you could do for rice what you did for the potatoes because people are still afraid now to eat rice because uh, of the arsenic issue. Well, let me try some of that. <clears throat> I, I wrote an article on this. By the way, you can go to my website and you could read essentially all the things that I've been telling you about. And uh, I, I wrote an article on rice and arsenic and the way it went was something like this. It was a consumer's report article about arsenic and rice. Well, the year before they had done a report on fruit juices and arsenic and the delivery of arsenic and fruit juices was, was far greater than that in rice. But people latched onto the rice thing. Well, why does arsenic have, why does rice have arsenic? Well, it's because they grow the rice on the same fields that they used to grow cotton on. And to kill the boll weevils, they would use arsenic. And of course that got into the soil. And the soil, uh, the, the rice uh, accumulated the arsenic. So how do you get arsenic free rice? We well, get rice that was grown on clean soils. And, and there are actually manufacturers out there that uh, make it a point to tell you that they have cleaner rice. And I encourage you to eat clean rice. I don't think it's a good idea to eat arsenic. But you know, I've not seen anybody who's died of arsenic poisoning in my whole career. But I've found a lot of people who have died from fat poisoning or a deficiency of starch poisoning. In fact, most of the people that I can think of right now have suffered from those kinds of poisonings, not arsenic poisoning. And you, you know, rice accum accumulates uh, various toxic metals from the soil. It's an efficient cum accumulator. But you know what's even a fish, more efficient accumulator are your cruciferous vegetables. They are hyper accumulators. They accumulate all kinds of toxic metals. So you wanna get a really toxic diet in terms of heavy metals, you, you pick on your cruciferous vegetables, your nutrient dense foods. Uh, you know, get, just get the point I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to focus your attention that you are a starch eater always have and always will be. That uh, green and yellow vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, they have their place. They add color, flavor, texture. You know, they're interesting. They add a few extra nutrients and some of them are important. And nuts and seeds, uh, they're not unhealthy. They're just fattening. They're 90% fat. Why do you think nature put them in hard shells? Yep. Coconuts, coconuts, that's the hardest shell I know about. What does that tell you about coconut? Oh my God. And, and so there's so many people promoting coconut oil as. You know, AJ, a lot of people promote a lot of things and it's based on things that they do and also things that they sell, but it ain't the truth. And uh, the truth is very simple. You know, every religion teaches it. The bulk of the scientific literature teaches it. Uh, geography, history teaches it. The human being is a star cheater. We have survived and are most efficient. We function the best, we look the best on a diet based on starches like rice, corn, potatoes, wheat, barley, you name it. There are thousands of different starches out there. There are some that are really common like rice, corn, potatoes, and wheat. Potatoes are the third leading crop worldwide. And they're the most efficient crop out of the three rice and corn. And it's the one that's gonna carry us through the future. It's the one that we have to rely on as the World Health Organization has told us if we we're going to feed the world. That's my project. Uh, you know, I spent, I spent 45 years studying the scientific literature from the point of view of a doctor that's seen 12,000 patients. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I've uh, come to some understandings about, about nutrition that have resulted in Tremendous improvement in people's health. And we publish this in the scientific literature, you know, curing nearly 100% of the time type 2 diabetes, reducing uh, cholesterol levels uh, 
20 points in seven days, reducing the amount of medication. We published this in the scientific literature by 90% in seven days. We, we have 90% of our patients reduce their medications for blood pressure and diabetes or stop the medication altogether at our clinic in seven days. So, you know, the, the facts are there. You can, you can believe what you want, but you know, the truth is the truth and the truth is simple and easy to understand. And what I've taught you is easy to understand. Dr. McDougall, there's a couple of questions about your program. I believe you're running another one next month in November. The first one from Susanna asking if after COVID, will the program ever return to in-person? Uh, I hope not. I hope it doesn't return to in-person. In and the first reason is, is that this program run with telemedicine, telehealth over the internet has been far more effective. We get better results than we ever got at the clinic. And it's far easier for people. It's, it, it's caught the cost to people by two thirds, you know, instead of spending $10,000 to come and see us in Santa Rosa, California, they spend $3,000. The, the contact we have with the individual participants is so much greater over the internet and it's so much more intimate. I know this may be hard for you to understand. We have uh, appointments with our medical doctor, Dr. Anthony Lim, board certified family practitioner. He loves it. He gets to spend as much time as he wants with each and every participant from the luxury of his home and the luxury of their home. You know, they don't have to travel all the way from Europe or Asia with the expense and the trouble and the risks that they do. They just turn on their computer. And we have support specialists. We have uh, three people who meet with them every morning, talk to them about how they're doing, what their blood sugar is, what their blood pressure is, what what their weight is, what they're cooking for breakfast, lunch, or dinner today. Every morning they meet with our support specialists, not just during the 12 day program, but we see them for a year afterwards at a regular interval. And actually we have relationships with people who run through the program for a lifetime. And the only way that you become a McDougall patient is you go through the 12 day program. You either went through it at uh, St. Lena Hospital when I used to teach it there or in Santa Rosa when I taught it at a resort or by the internet now. Otherwise, we don't take any individual patients. I don't take one night stands anymore. I wanna to get to know you. And Mary and I had a great opportunity. Every morning we meet with participants and, and you've joined some of those sessions, AJ. They are so spontaneous. We've got these fireside chats every morning for 12 days, Mary and I do. We get, we get to joke, we use it to you know, talk to people about personal things in our lives, their lives, and answer an awful lot of their questions. This is so much more intimate. I love it. That's I why we get better results. Well, that you've pretty much answered this question that Karen said, I want to do your program, but I'm not sure a virtual program will work for me. Can it, has it worked for others? You know, you know we, we've collected the data. We've run the program for more than a year now. Yeah, we've put, uh, let's see, that would be about, about 400 people through the program. We take 40 people a, a program and uh, our weight losses are better and they're sustained. I mean, they're sustained because I think people learn better over the internet. You know, uh, you, you, you skip a class, it's recorded. You can watch it later. You have a problem, uh, you can get a hold of uh, Dr. Lim or myself, you know, right away, you get it discussed. Uh, you can talk to one of the support, support specialists. Jeff, Jeff Novick, Doug Lyle, Jack Dixon, they're there to teach you and also to help you. The lectures they give, uh, well, I wanna tell you, there's another point of view as to why we're not gonna run the program uh, live anymore. And that is the staff is so much happier. You know, they have such a, and they didn't think so before we started it. You know, Jeff Novick and Doug Lyle, both of them said, you know, I, this isn't gonna work. But now if you talk to either one of these men, they'll tell you, this is a far, more beneficial experience for the participants than they could ever accomplish in a live program. That's absolutely it's better in every way. Yeah. And, and you teach the program sometimes. No, I love it. That's it's better for me, but it's all Doug Lyle said. The only thing he misses is Mary's lasagna and chocolate pudding. Yeah. You know, I was going to say he misses the brownies too. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, Dr. McDougall, I agree with you about virtual learning, because since the pandemic began, I went back into acting, doing my improv and comedy class online, and I'm doing so much better with my craft, because I, I agree, it's just, you're so much more focused, like, when you're here, that's just my opinion. So how do you feel about this question from Gerard? What about losing weight? Can one still eat potatoes and lose weight? Hello, that's how I lost 50 pounds. That's all I ate. Linda yeah. Middlesworth, who's watching, that's all she eats, and she's almost 80 and thin and a cancer survivor. Well, Mary and I are looking pretty thin. I'm not gonna take my shirt off and show you, but yeah, uh, think about it. Think about populations of people like the Asians. Do you, do you, when you think of overweight people when you think about people from Japan or China or Vietnam or Thailand, uh, hundreds of thousands of people standing in a town square, no one is overweight. Living on starch, potatoes, rice, corn. Just open your eyes. I mean, it's all there. And when these people become wealthy, you know, the business people, the government officials, and they give up their starch-based diet and they start eating like Americans, what do you see? What do you see? Overweight, unhealthy people, if you didn't figure it out by now. So yeah, it's... Uh, you know, this is, this, is a, uh, this is a concept that we don't have to ask you to believe. You know, you could just look and see it. It's so obvious. It's so, it's so consistent. There's no contradiction in what we're telling you. This cuts your food bill by 60 to 80 percent, right? switching from the American diet to a starch-based diet. You know, it's just everything. It's, it, it fits in with your religious teachings, whether you're a Christian or you're Hindu or whatever your religion is, they teach in your, uh, in your Bible or whatever, your, your book of uh, religion, they, they teach that, that the best diet to eat is a starch-based diet. And that when you know, a few selected people become rich, kings and queens, you, they call them, they get fat and sick. You know, rich foods make people sick. You know, back then, there were only a few rich people, you know, a few pharaohs few priests, a few kings, a few queens, a few aristocrats. The bulk of the people were toiling in the fields. You know, they were building the pyramids. They were, they were growing the crops. And uh, they were all thin. So, you know, back then there were just a few aristocrats. And now since the industrial revolution and the harnessing of fossil fuel, almost every, I mean, half the people on this planet have become rich. They live like kings and queens and it shows. So how do you fix the problem? Well, you, you stop eating the food of kings and queens, you know, the meat, the dairy, the cakes, the pies, and you start eating the food of the laborers, uh, which is starch, starch. You've got to get over the, the word starch in terms of it being a negative thing. You know, we used to call, we used to call what we, uh, what we had for meals, uh, starch. You know, you ask grandma what, what was for dinner and it was potatoes or spaghetti or, you know, some other kind of pasta or it was rice and mushu vegetables. It, it used to be that way. Now, of course, you ask what's for dinner and they say fried chicken, <laughs> pepperoni pizza. Yeah, keto you know, diet. Carnivore diet. That's what people are saying to eat to lose weight. Dr. McDougall, I think this is a legitimate question because this comes up a lot from people that are new to this, especially if they're diabetic, like type two diabetic or have insulin resistance. They say that when they eat potatoes, their blood sugar goes up. So therefore they're afraid to eat them. Well, get over it. Get over it. I mean, the, the goal is to get your health back. That's the goal. And that's what you do by eating a starch based diet. Well, what is the purpose of eating? It's to raise your blood sugar. It's supposed to go up. But what you want to do is you want to uncure, you want to cure the underlying problem. The problem with type two diabetes is that you develop insulin resistance, which is a normal adaptation for eating rich food. So you develop uh, insulin resistance. Insulin pushes fat into the fat cells and insulin allows sugar to go into the regular cells. All right, so if you make the insulin inefficient, then what happens is it can't it can't uh, push, put the sugar into the cells. It allows the sugar to be in the bloodstream. You know, the reason you become type two diabetic is because of a normal adaptation. And that is that uh, you're, it's okay to gain 30, 40, 50 pounds. You can still get away from the saber-toothed tiger. You can still fit in that 
tight cave entrance and save yourself. But 30 or 40 pounds is enough. And the body says, hey, you know, this is getting to be a problem with survival. You gaining any more pounds, like 50, 60, 80 pounds. And therefore, I'm not going to I'm not going to allow the insulin to be effective. You develop insulin resistance. And that's what type 2 diabetes is. Now, I, I see an occasional patient who, who doesn't develop insulin resistance. And it's, it's been a lesson and one that I give my students when we take care of when we take in medical students, which is what we do in residence, and is uh, occasionally you'll find somebody who doesn't develop insulin resistance. These will be people that weigh five, 600 pounds. Or I've seen on the evening news, uh, the person that they had to take a forklift in and pick them up out of the bed. They didn't develop insulin resistance, so they just kept stuffing the fat in the fat cells. Uh, it never stops. And these are uh, occasional people. But when you look at these people that are five, six, 700 pounds, they don't have diabetes. They don't have high cholesterol. Their arteries are clean. They got bad joints because carrying around that weight's pretty hard on the hips and the knees and ankles. But otherwise, you know, they're pretty darn healthy people. So it's good that you develop insulin resistance. It's, it's a normal adaptation. So that, you know, kind of limited, like you say, 30, 40 pounds of weight gain, then you stop. Dr. McDougall, Joanne wants to know how important is it to get organic potatoes? Oh boy, uh, you know, it's, 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 we do that. I mean, in our family, we teach, as a secondary thought, we teach people to buy organic because the chemicals are quite dangerous. They, they clearly you know, initiate and promote cancer. They clearly are toxic to the nervous system causing Parkinson's disease. I mean, these, these chemicals are not good. But, you know, you, you got to fight your battles where you can fight your battles and where it's most important to win. And if you, uh, in addition to have to figure out that you need to eat potatoes and rice and corn and bread and pasta, you, you figure out, you know, you, somebody puts another restriction on you, it's got to all be organic. You know, that, that, that could be a barrier to you making changes that are most crucial for you because you're dying of these diseases. Your life is being destroyed by these diseases. So, you know, we do teach organic and, and uh, I don't wanna minimize it, except for the fact that if, if you're a, the typical patient that we take care of, the typical person who's got diabetes and heart disease and breast cancer and colon cancer and, and uh, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, hey, we got, we got some, it's a bad analogy, big fish to fry. <laughs> I should probably should I should have kept that one in. Uh, we we had yeah, we got to we know we got to get you out of trouble, and I'm I'm going to put up as few barriers as possible. And unfortunately, you know, eating everything organic is is uh, a barrier that will cause some people to say, "Hey, this is just too much." Right. Well, I love that you debunk all the myths, and you know, the other one, other than the arsenic and rice and the, the potatoes, is this essential fatty acid thing that we need to have nuts or seeds every day or take a DHA supplement or we're going to get dementia or heart disease. Yeah, this is another thing that people promote that I'd love to have a discussion with them about anytime they want. Uh, you know, there are essential fatty acids. There are two alpha, lenalen alpha lenalenic acid and lenalenic acid. There are uh, omega-3 and omega-6 fats, and they're only made by plants. And there's loads of essential fat in plants. You just can't miss. It's impossible to develop a fatty acid deficiency on any natural diet. It can't be done. Now, the only reason that fish have omega-3 fats is because they ate seaweed. Animals do not desaturate at the carbon-3 and carbon-6 position. Only plants can do that. So if any of your animal food has omega-3 fats, it's because that animal ate plants and that, the plants made it. So why not just go to the plants and eat it? You can't miss, it's always enough. Whether it's potatoes, which are 1% fat total and only a third of that is essential fat. The body's very efficient at surviving. Look at what it goes through. What it goes through is entirely the wrong food. You eat cat food. You eat food that you wouldn't feed your cats and dogs and you live. You know, most, most diets that we talk about in the past have been ones where you've you, you just wonder whether you're going to get enough to eat to feed you and the kids. Oh, is, is mom or dad going to come home with enough food, which 
brings me into another subject, which is hunter gatherers. You know, we praise the hunters. Uh, we don't say much about the gatherers, but this is a, uh, a, a gender bias, sexual discrimination. Uh, we praise the hunters because who are hunters? They're the men. And who are the gatherers? They're the women, the grandparents, the children. You know, the hunters get all the praise, but they get very little, little of the food because animals aren't that easy to catch and to get them back to the village without them spoiling is pretty tough too. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 think you should, I think you should get your food like 99.9999% of the people who walk this earth have gotten their food. This, this, this rich diet with so much variety and so much uh, extra rules that you have, it's only been around for 50 to 100 years. You know, in the time that I've been alive, AJ, we've gone from a planet where we ate primarily starch-based diets to where rich foods are dominant and starches are condemned. And we are going to be going to a time, and I'm going to live long enough for it, unfortunately, where that's all the food that's going to be available. Hey, folks, get on to the McDougal diet now by choice, because pretty soon, that's all that's going to be available is, if you're lucky, is rice and corn and beans. You know, just look around at what's happening. And remember, remember, a, a, a card that's not being played is the diet. You know, clearly, you can reduce the global warming gases, you as an individual overnight, and potentially the whole world can reduce the production of global warming gases by somewhere between 50 and 80%. That's what the Eat Lancet Commission says. That's what scientific research says. It may be sound like you know, it's unbelievable, but the power of the plate, so to speak, it, it is it's bizarre for me to say that for some of you to understand and to believe that we could save the planet by eating starch is for me to say that you can save your life by eating starch, but I've proven it to you. You know, many of you are my patients and you know, I bet, I bet you have fulfilled something I always wanted to fulfill and that I, you know, I, I, I was okay for me, for people to come back and said, uh, said, uh, I heard what you, what you recommend, but I couldn't do it. You know, that's okay. Yeah, I understand. This is not easy, but I, I know I could have never tolerated people coming back to me and say, you know, I did what you said and it didn't work. Now, I can't think of anybody I can't think of an email. I can't think of a patient I've taken care of. 12,000 patients I've touched that has ever come back to me and said, I did what you said and it didn't give me the results you promised. Now, it doesn't mean you're gonna solve all your problems. I mean, good grief, you got bent up joints from arthritis. They're not gonna straighten out, but you can stop the inflammation and the pain. You know, the heart muscle you killed by forming a blood clot in your heart due to the meat and dairy and stuff you eat, that heart muscle ain't going to grow back, but you can stop having other heart attacks and strokes and impotence and all kinds of problems. Uh, the food's a miracle. It is an absolute miracle, but it's, it is missed. It's, you know, AJ, when I, when I started all this, I discovered this back, I had everything pretty much figured out by 1977. When I lived in Hawaii, I had a practice there. That's where I did my training. And I had everything figured out. And I, I, and I thought, in fact, I told my chief of medicine that uh, I'm going to have people uh, lined up all the way from the Honolulu airport to my office door waiting to see me. Uh, that crowd never formed, AJ. Uh, but the miracle is still there. I mean, you can do far, far more. You know, Walter Kempner showed it. Nathan Pritigan showed it. This is nothing original that I discovered. You do far, far more in terms of returning people's health and personal appearance and function by switching diet than you can do with any pill or surgery. You know, these are temporary fixes at best with great price to pay in terms of side effects and money. Food's free. <laughs> you know, you gotta buy the stuff anyways. In fact, you, I told you, you cut the food bill by 80%. Yeah, uh, something so obvious, but hey, you know, somehow or another, it's been a tough sell. And sad to say, I think it's going to be a continued tough sell 
even when the realization comes as to what the impact of food is on the climate. I hope not. And I, I've dedicated the last uh, 45 years of my life to helping people solve personal health problems. And I'm pretty much done with that. Outside of little things like the lecture I gave today, mm, trying to straighten out some things that I didn't believe were said correctly by Dr. Greger. Uh, my focus of attention ever since my first grandson was born 17 years ago has been on what in the world can I do to help slow down this destruction of our planet. And there's one thing that I know better than pretty much anybody, and that's food. And there's one thing Mary and I know, and our program knows almost better than anybody. And that's how to make dietary changes. So we're going to take our talents and we're gonna to continue to apply them to patients. We're, we run very successful programs. Since we've changed to a telemedicine program, it's, you know, we've been sold out pretty much every program. So, you know, I, 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 but I, you know, Dr. Lim does that and I, I get involved in that occasionally. I really don't have to find any more new things in the, in the nutritional medical literature. I think I pretty much found out most of what needs to be discovered. But the challenge for me is how in the world are you going to get people to change to save the planet? Oh, you know, even people who have the money and the power to do it aren't doing it like Bill Gates. You know, he comes out and he pleads uh, for people to do anything and everything to save the planet because he knows what kind of trouble we're in. Unfortunately, he does his interviews from his favorite burger joint in Seattle, eating a cheeseburger. Excuse me. You know, there's a big disconnect between, between the science and what we ought to be doing and people's personal habits. They can't see beyond their dinner plate, AJ. And the consequences are so great. You know, I, I, I will spend the rest of my life, my years on this planet, trying to figure out how to get people to change. Just like I spent the last 45 years trying to get people to change to save themselves. The first book Mary and I put together back in 1978 was called Making the Change. It wasn't called Heal and Stay Healthy or Fix Your Diseases with Food. It was called Making the Change because I knew back then the difficulty would get people to do this. That, that's where I'm gonna focus my attention. And we've got a new website coming up on diet and the climate. It's called Diet Therapy for Planet Earth. You know, it's just like the practice that I've done with you folks. It's called diet therapy. Diet therapy, I know that's an unfamiliar word, just like starch used to be an unfamiliar word, but it's such an important concept, diet therapy. And I, I've, I've taken care of, well, lots of people, you know, probably, you know, oh, let's not even get into figures, but I've, I've had helped a lot of people by diet therapy, principles taught by Nathan Pritikin and Walter Kempner. That's diet therapy. That, that's changing people's diets short-term and long-term to result in curing their diseases. Now, my new patient, diet therapy for planet Earth. She's my new patient. And uh, I'm gonna do everything I can uh, to get her well. And I, I know that I only have a small thing to do, but it's an important part that Mary and I and the rest of the team are gonna play because we have this knowledge and we're gonna share it. Lots of things that need to be done. Fossil fuels, of course, a big one. Lots of things that need to be done, but the food needs to be fixed or we're not gonna solve the, the fate of our planet. You know, and experts say that. They're talking about experts like Cambridge in England, uh, which are dedicated to diet and climate change. They're, they're experts, they've realized it. You know, we're not gonna solve it by stopping fossil fuels. We need to do that, of course, but it's too late. Back in the 1970s, when we started talking about this, we could have fixed it by switching to electric cars, solar, wind power. Yeah, we could have, but you know, this is uh, 50 years later. Uh, the accumulation of damage is so great that just stopping the fossil fuels, changing the energy production is not going to be enough. And uh, experts who are involved in this, I'll tell you, the last card we have to play and the most important one is the food. Somehow, somehow we have to convince people that they need to go back to eat like their ancestor did a hundred years ago. They need to eat traditional diets like a 
diet based on rice like Asians did up until 1980. Like the Aztecs and Mayans did for 1300 years, fighting battles, running governments, having children, the people of the corn. You know, we don't have to call it a vegan diet or the McDougal diet. I'm not going to do that. Those bring up a lot of emotions, but you know, talk about the diet of your ancestors, traditional diets, and that's what we have to return to. I think I can get people to warm up to that concept. You know, and some of you are old enough to remember when you went to Italian grandma's house, it was pasta you had. I remember when I went to Italy in 1970, I felt cheated because they didn't put cheese on my pizza. <laughs> you know, things have changed so much in the last 50 years. As I said before, in my lifetime, we've changed from a planet where most of the population ate a starch-based diet to, because of necessity, we will again eat a starch-based diet. We can do it under our own will, or we're gonna be forced to do it because there's gonna be nothing else available, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be glad to get a potato. Amen to that, Dr. McDougall. I think that's a perfect place to end because we are so blessed that you're going to be coming back once a month. You are scheduled for Monday, November 1st, which happens to be World Vegan Day. You're going to be going up with your wonderful wife, Mary, at 11. Dr. McDougall, we have people that have been in your program 40 years ago, like, for example, Mary Joan watching, and they all thank you so much. I can't tell you how good that makes me feel, uh, AJ. You know, (laughs) we have a positive experience of people getting well, you know, over 12 days because they do. But when I really feel like I've done my job is when somebody says to me, you know, I heard your lecture at St. Francis Hospital in Honolulu 45 years ago. And today, you know, I'm driving a car. I don't have a disability sticker. I'm out uh, doing walks with my friends. And you know what? That's the few friends I have, which are usually 20 years younger than me, because most of them, my contemporaries, they're either dead or they're in wheelchairs or they're in nursing homes because they didn't get a message that you gave me 45 years ago. I mean, that makes me feel really good. I feel like I've been a doctor, done my job. But thank you, AJ. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank to- you so much, Dr. McDougall. And thanks all of you for watching. I need five minutes to reset. And then we come back with two more wonderful plant-based doctors, Dr. Lori Marvis and Dr. Nikki Davis. But Dr. McDougall, I think I'd like to summarize what you said today, at least what oh, I heard. Okay. John McDougall, he's a man. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't been saying this in a while. I'm so, you make me so nervous. John, oh. John McDougall has a plan based on carbohydrates. If you eat them, you'll be thin and won't have ass or thigh weight. John McDougall, he's the man. He's as smart as Plato. Eating starch will make you thin and save the planet. Just eat a damn potato.